Right. And we are in the week before Passover. People are gathering in Jerusalem from all over Palestine to, um, you know, getting ready to celebrate the big festival. But everybody comes in early. They have been finding places to stay. They've been exchanging their Roman coins for temple coins. They've been purchasing the necessary sacrifices and just, you know, touristing. They're touring the sights and sounds and smells of the big city. But there's another main attraction this year. This year, everyone is jockeying to see the prophet from Galilee, the man who has been outlawed by the Sanhedrin, the ruling religious elite. They want to see the man with a price on his head who seems to flaunt the religious authorities. He's a celebrity prophet who's surrounded by his supporters, fanatics who prevent his arrest by their sheer numbers. It is a madhouse. Everyone wants to see Jesus and everyone knows a showdown is coming. Jews have traveled from all over the world to come to Passover in Jerusalem. Some of them are Greeks. Now these Greeks, must be very well off to have come so far. Jerusalem is here and they come all the way from like here, which is a big deal back then. It's a it's a pilgrimage of a lifetime and they for sure aren't going to miss the main attraction. The Greeks approach Philip, one of the disciples, and tell him they want to meet Jesus. Well, Philip goes to tell Andrew, also a disciple who's an old buddy of Philip's from his hometown. They must be astounded that Jesus' fame has spread so far. And together, Andrew and Philip go to tell Jesus about the Greeks' request to see him. The significance of this moment is not lost on Jesus. Word is out. If he has attracted attention as far away as Greece, which is also part of the Roman Empire shown in red here, then he will have caught the attention of the center of power in Rome itself. Time is running out. The last grains of sand are slipping through the hourglass. Jesus announces to his disciples and, of course, all the crowds of people pressing in from all sides, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I bet a cheer goes up from the crowd. They think he's finally, finally going to reveal himself as the Messiah and an army is going to materialize from somewhere. But of course, that's not at all what Jesus is talking about. Jesus continues, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. But whoever holds his life in this world in lower esteem, we might say whoever holds his life in this world with open hands, will be guarding his eternal life. Jesus is letting his disciples know that the time for him to die has come. And this, of course, ratchets up the danger for his disciples too. So he offers them a choice to stay or to go, saying, if anyone wants to help me or support me, let him follow me. Wherever I am, there my servants, my ministers will be, and the Father will honor such as these. Then Jesus seems to lower his voice, perhaps talking to himself, he says, but now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, no, this is the reason I have come into this world. And then I imagine he raises his head and speaks clearly for all to hear. Father, glory be to your name. And a voice answers from heaven saying, I have glorified it and will glorify it again consternation ripples through the crowd. Everyone heard this. Some say, it was, it was just thunder, it's just thunder. While others say, an angel spoke to him. Jesus says, that voice was for your benefit, not mine. This world will be judged now. 
and the ruler of this world will be cast out. That word ruler means leader of the hierarchy, the leader of the powers that be. Jesus says, and if the son of man is raised up from the earth, everything will be drawn to me. Now that word earth in the Greek is not metaphorical. It, it is the word that literally means the land itself. He's not using the word the word cosmo, which is, you know, world, you know, like what he just used when he talked about judgment of the world. In this phrase where he says, if I am raised up from the earth, he's talking about the physical ground, the land now. And that word for drawn means to drag or haul something. <laughs> Jesus, upon his resurrection, will act as a magnet for everyone and everything. He drags us with him into life. No conditions. The word for everything is the word all. All things, all people, everything will be drawn into life by Jesus. Life is God's plan for all of creation. Well, the crowd thinks he's the Messiah. So this, quote, being raised from the earth stuff totally confuses them. They say, how's this son of man you're talking about? So obviously, these are out of town folks who don't know that son of man is what Jesus always calls himself. They say, what do you mean the son of man has to be raised from the earth? The law says the Messiah will, will live forever. And Jesus replies, the light will be with you only a little longer. Walk in the light while you have it, so the darkness will not lay hold of you. For those walking in darkness have no idea where they're going. Believe in the light, so you may become children of the light. And when he finishes speaking, Jesus once again slips away. The people murmur to each other, believe in the light? Even though they've seen his signs and miracles, many still will not believe him or believe in him. John says this was to fulfill the words of prophecy. He quotes the first line of a famous passage in Isaiah 53. Um, he says this fulfills the words, who has believed our message? To whom has the strength of Yahweh been revealed? This is the same prophecy that talks about the Messiah being despised and rejected, dying from our violence when he had done nothing wrong. And then John remembers the words the Lord spoke to the prophet Isaiah when he called him to be his spokesperson to the kings. The Lord said, Go tell these people, they will hear, but never understand. They will see, but never comprehend. Make their hearts calloused. Otherwise, they will see and hear and turn to me and be healed. Well, Isaiah fulfilled this simply by standing up to the kings and telling them the truth. And the king's hearts were hardened, calloused, just as Pharaoh's heart was hardened when Moses spoke truth to him. John rewords this passage as a memory of how the kings responded to Isaiah's truth. And he says here in his gospel that Isaiah's prophecy had a dual meaning. It didn't just apply to those ancient kings, but it also applies here and now to Jesus. Jesus is speaking truth to power, and power hardens its heart and refuses to see or hear, and thus it turns its back on God and on healing. People are having to make choices now. Will they follow Jesus as their Messiah, or will they side with the Sanhedrin, the ruling religious elites, who have put a bounty on his head? Many of the Jewish leaders do believe in Jesus, but they're too afraid of the Pharisees to speak up. They're afraid of being cast out of their local faith communities, their synagogues. John excoriates these men in his gospel, saying their actions showed they love the honor of men more than the honor of God. Ouch. Jesus then pops up again in the midst of the crowd and cries, if you believe in me, 
you believe in the one who sent me. If you look at me, you are looking at the one who sent me. I am a light that has come into the world to chase away the darkness. I will not judge you, even if you hear my words, but do not keep them. Let that soak in for a minute. That's in John 12, 47. Jesus has said this before, that he has not come to judge the world nor to condemn it. He continues, I did not come to judge the world, but to save it, to heal it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not take in my words. It is my word itself that will judge him in the last day. For it was the father who spoke, who commanded what I should say. And I know his commandment is eternal life. And that is the word I have spoken. Now look at this carefully. Notice the chain of logic. God's commandment is eternal life. That is God's will and desire. And that is the word Jesus has spoken into the world. That is what he came for. That is what he's been doing all along. That is what he is doing now. He is speaking life into the world. And notice that it is that word which will be the judge on the last day. Life, eternal life. Life will be the judge. To put it another way, just as darkness cannot stand in the presence of light, so also death cannot stand in the presence of eternal life. Way back, just before he died, Moses said the same thing to the brand new Israelite nation. He said, the choice I'm giving you today, guys, is not difficult. It is a choice between life and prosperity or death and destruction. This has been God's offer from the beginning. Jesus has brought this same offer to all the world. We get to choose which we prefer, life or death, light or darkness. We are our own judges. For our choices speak aloud the intent of our hearts. Well, this does not sit well at all with the religious leaders. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders all come together and demand, tell us, by what authority do you do these things? Who told you you could do this? And Jesus says, let me ask you one thing. Was the baptism of John from heaven or not. Now that <laughs> Jesus is a pretty slippery character. You see, the problem is that John the Baptist is revered by the people as a great prophet who has been martyred. Crowds of people have been baptized by him, and many of them are standing right here listening in. And John um, the Baptist had been very clear that as to Jesus' identity as the Son of God. So the religious leaders all huddle together. Wow, if we say John's baptism was from heaven, then he'll ask us why we didn't believe him. But if we say it was not, the people will stone us. So they say to Jesus, we don't know. <laughs> that is so lame. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus says, well, then I won't tell you by whose authority I do these things. Yeah, this is such a great moment. It gets recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, essentially verbatim. And Jesus follows it up with a short parable. He says, once upon a time, a man had two sons. He went to the first one and said, go work in the vineyard today. But the son said, nope, not going to do it. But a little later, that son repented. He changed his mind and he went. 
Meanwhile, the father went to the other son and asked him the same thing. And that son said, sure, but then he didn't go. Jesus asked the religious leaders, so which son did his father's will? And they answer, well, obviously it was the one who went and did the work. And Jesus says, exactly. That's why the tax collectors and prostitutes are going ahead of you into the kingdom of God. For the tax collectors and prostitutes believed. But you, even after you saw that, you did not repent and believe him. Him meaning himself, Jesus, the son of man. But Jesus isn't done yet. He says, I got another parable for you. Once upon a time, there was a homeowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, and dug a wine press. He even put a guard tower up. Then he rented it out to some vine dressers and went traveling abroad. When the time came for him to collect his rent, he sent his servants to receive his fruit. But the vine dressers seized them. They beat one servant, stoned another, and even killed one. Again, the homeowner sent more servants, but they did the same to them as well. Finally, the homeowner sent his son, saying, they'll at least respect my own son. But when the vine dressers saw it was the son, they said, let's kill him too, so we can have his inheritance. Which in this parable, as you can see, is the vineyard itself. And thus they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, what is the homeowner going to do to those vine dressers? Jesus asks. And the religious leaders answer, he will destroy those evil vine dressers. And then he'll rent the vineyard out to vine dressers who will give him fruit in due season. Exactly, Jesus replies. Haven't you read the scripture that says the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is wonderful in our eyes. Well, that's kind of a weird response. So thinking about this parable, the stone in the psalm here, this cornerstone, would be like the son in the parable who was cast out, rejected, killed, right? In the parable, the son would be the one the Lord has made into the cornerstone, the most important stone in the building, the one upon which all else is built. And Jesus says, that's why the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to those actually producing its fruit. The one falling on this cornerstone will be shattered and it will crush anyone it falls upon. He's telling them they're stumbling over the stum this cornerstone. And of course, the religious leaders know that's what Jesus is saying. He, he's, they know Jesus is saying they're like the evil vine dressers, while he is the son, the cornerstone set by the Lord. And they want to arrest him on the spot, but they can't because they're afraid of the crowd, because the people believe Jesus is a great prophet. So according to Mark and Luke, they send spies out pretending to be followers of Jesus in hopes that they can catch him saying something they can arrest him for. After all, Jesus has already entered Jerusalem while the people around him waved branches and exclaimed, Hosanna, son of David. And Rome has not yet made a move. But Rome is obviously aware of the incident and is keeping an eye on things, the religious leaders realize it will take very little to tip the scales. So this time, the Pharisees don't just send their own spies, they enlist Jews who support Roman rule. Now, we haven't run across this group yet. Not all Jews support home rule. The Jews who support Roman rule are called Herodians. And although they normally would never cooperate with the fiercely independent Pharisees, in this case, both parties see Jesus as a national threat. 
Now, Jesus is teaching among the crowds, as he always is, and these spies approach him and ask a question. They're sure will trap him. They say, teacher, we know you are true and you teach the way of God in truth, and you care nothing about what other people think of you. So tell us, is it lawful to pay the poll tax to Caesar or not? Now, the poll tax is one of the most resented taxes that Rome imposes. The word for this tax literally means muzzle. It's a relatively new tax. And since it's like a flat tax per person, it's regressive, meaning it hits the poorer people harder than it hits the rich people. So these guys figure they've got Jesus now. If Jesus thinks he's the Messiah King, he's not going to want to send any money to Rome, right? And besides that, he's always on the side of the poor. Plus, he keeps talking about this kingdom of God. Now, they know he pays the temple taxes. There was a time earlier that the temple tax had come due and the temple tax collectors had accosted Peter and asked him, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? And Peter says, oh, yeah, yeah, he really does. Even though he knew Jesus did not have the money to pay it. So Peter runs back to Jesus and Jesus says to him, what do you think, Simon Peter? Do the kings of the earth collect taxes from their own children? or from strangers? And Peter answers, well, from strangers, of course. And Jesus says, exactly. The children of the kingdom are exempt from tax. But just so we don't cause a kerfluffle, go and cast a fishing hook, and the very first fish you get, open its mouth. And inside you will find a four drachma coin, the exact amount and exact special type of temple coin you need to go and pay both your temple tax and mine. So this, this story of the temple tax is bound to have spread like wildfire. These spies know that Jesus pays the temple tax, but will he object on religious grounds to paying taxes to Rome? What will he say about paying the poll tax? But Jesus knows their motivation and the evil that is in their hearts. And he says, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Here, give me the coin used to pay the poll tax. And they give him a denarius, a coin worth about a day's wage. And Jesus says, Whose likeness is engraved on this coin? Whose inscription is on it? And they answer, Caesar's. And Jesus says, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. So many translations say, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but the Greek does not use the normal word for give. The Greek here is give back. That is such an important concept. We are to give back to God what is God's already? What was God's from the beginning? All good things we have come from God in the first place. We live in a never-ending cycle of blessing and giving back, blessing and giving back, a cycle of abundant life, quite different than what we experience with governments and taxes, which interestingly enough, we tend to associate with death right? <laughs> well, that certainly shuts the spies up, so they leave. In our breakout groups, we're going to talk about what it means when Jesus says his time has come. That's This is an, a really important moment in Jesus' life, and there's there's a lot of questions. I know Julia told me to cut it down to one or two questions. I don't seem to be capable of that. So um, today, spend a little bit of time on question one, move quickly through question two. It's mostly just quick yes or no answers where I just want to point out a few things to you and make sure you leave enough time to get to question three. There we all are. Yay. All righty. Um, I got cut off mid, mid thought. Who did? <laughs> Shirley. Oh, go, Shirley. Yeah. I was just so saying, did, we concentrate so, so hard on 
like the choice A and B. Should we go do this? Should we do that? Instead of just surrendering. I'm going to move forward and trust that God is going to lead. And it isn't, I have to choose A or I have to choose B. It's, I have to move forward with what if, with where God leads. I just got to let him lead me. And it takes the pressure off because we put so much pressure on ourselves. Like, is this the right decision? And I mean, there have been some decisions that I have made in recent years that I agonized over. And looking back, the decision really had already been made years before. But I was fighting it. God had already led, but I fought him every step of the way. And uh, you said Martha got cut off in mid-sentence? No, Martha yes. disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, sorry about that. I hope you got my note. <laughs> we just saw the first part that said she wasn't raptured. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it only showed you that part? Oh, okay. I didn't that's know. That's the second reference to me disappearing recently and whether or not rapture had happened. So, <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. No, it was the, the groups were uneven. And when she popped over, it put her in the group that was, was too, had too many folks in it. So I moved her and I wanted to let y'all know what was going on. Oh, okay. Yeah, we knew she was gone and she wasn't raptured. That's all we knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Martha, did you have thoughts you wanted to complete? Uh, you got cut off at the end. Okay. Sure. She said she's good. All righty. So um, on question one, uh, basically was Jesus had always up to this point said, my time's not yet. My time's not yet. He told his brothers that, you know, there's all the, several times he said this. And then all of a sudden, when the Greeks come and ask to meet him, he says, okay, it's time. And my question was, do y'all think it was the Greeks? And if so, why or why not? Or do you think it was something else? You know, what are your thoughts on why now? Why that, why that moment? We struggled with his humanity and his spirituality of being God and we kind of figured you have some explaining to do because not me <laughs> it's, it was confusing to us because okay I can't even encapsulate all we discussed it was did he know because he is God? Did he know all these things? Did he know them as a child? Did he know them all his life? Or was God revealing it to him? How could that happen if he is God? But he came here, as Brian pointed out, to experience our situation, our, our experience of life. And he couldn't really zero in on that if he had all this knowledge within him of the future and what was going to happen at that time how would he be able to experience humanity and what we experience but at the same time he's god how do you, what do y'all think well i thought you kind of tipped your hand on the answer to that when you said in the lesson part that when Jesus realized that the Greeks had heard about him, that it was most likely that Rome also was keeping an eye on him. And knowing that his, his fame had spread that far, put him in the spotlight. And that that might've been the moment where he thought, oh, okay, you know, this, this has spread farther than just locally. And yeah, this is, we're coming up on the time. Yeah, and that, but that's just, that's one way to look at it. You know, that's how I see it. Um, but that, um, to Julia's point, is on the side of he didn't know in advance. You know, that is on, on the side of if he became human, he's like what Shirley was talking about. He's got A and B decisions going on and, 
and being in God is different than be, being God, you know, uh, in the same way that we are in God. Was Jesus in God or was he God in fully at that moment? Did he know everything? What do y'all think? Did he know, well, you know in advance this was the time and it, he just like, okay, time, you know? I was always taught that he was fully God and fully man. Mm -hmm. I'm still not sure what that means. Because it says when he came to the earth, he laid aside his glory. Mm -hmm. Now he emptied the words where he it, emptied himself, kenosis. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? I mean, we we saw the glory of God in the temple in the cloud by day and the fire by night. Mm -hmm. We saw the glory of God when Moses glowed. Jesus set that aside. I never realized until this lesson exactly what Jesus gave up. And I don't know if this is gospel, but this is what hit me in this. Jesus gave up his omniscience. Probably for a time, he gave up his omnipotence because could you imagine an all-powerful infant <laughs> who wants things now who wants things his way he had to give that up to become human and it never really hit me until just now and I even when I was teaching, my kids did a musical about Hark, the Herald Angel. And Hark was the one whose um, halo was tipped and he was dirty and late to choir practice, the whole nine yards. And one of the songs was when God becomes a baby, will he, and it went through all the things, will he cry when he's hungry? Will he hurt himself and get cut like we do? You know, and it has all these different questions about God as a child. But I never really had answers to those questions until just now. And I think, yes, God gave, or Jesus gave up part of his godliness in order to become human. He laid it aside temporarily knowing that he would pick it back up again. And before he became a baby, he probably knew the path that he was going to take. You would assume but once he became a baby, yeah. some of that had to be hidden from him so he could be a child, so he could grow, so he could learn. So he could be fully human. Yeah, you know? that, oh. it's not fair. That's Otherwise, the playing ground has to be level here. Yeah. My mind is just they all said when they were in the womb, knew each other, even when he was in his mom's tummy still. What he, who was it? Mm -hmm. uh, John. John the Baptist. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. I couldn't think of the other one was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But supposedly they were aware already before that. I've, I've always struggled with all that too. Like, well, we knew everything from the start. How much did his parents know? Yeah, and and so what if this record and the way it is unfolding for us shows us how far into the divine we as humans are invited now? Mm -hmm. If you think about the things that Jesus, if we accept the premise that he was fully human, you know, and that obviously he had to lay aside the, you know, the omniscience, the, you know, the, but it, it it's more of he had to take them and put them, leave them in God, the same place we have them. God, we we have access to God's power like Jesus did. We have access to God's God knowing everything. 
you know, like Jesus did. We just don't need to know all that stuff. We can't comprehend that stuff. We, that's what Jesus did was trust God and in the way that we need to. It occurs to me, and maybe I'm off on this, but I guess he separated himself from the Trinity. And that would be a very frightening thing for me to be separated from God. He is still within God's grace and love. There's that connection. And he had the wisdom, even as a child, and he had the ability to understand far greater, but he's human. I'm sorry, I got to take this call. Okay. Yeah, so, so was Jesus' message ever that he felt in any way separated from God? But there seems to be some distinction between being God and being in God. Uh, Martha, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Uh, barely, yeah. So I do think there's a time when um, he does feel separated from God. And that's when he says, God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. On the cross. Yeah. So not yet up to this point, but at that point, he asks a very human question. He does. Well, I've heard me, people ask the equivalent of that question. Let me ask uh, about that because somebody once said, or I read somewhere, that what Jesus said about, Lord, why have you forsaken me? That's the beginning. That's the first line of a psalm. It is, and you heard that from me in the Mark class, Woody. Yeah, and <laughs> and and it it starts out, you know, very uh, uh, filled with doubt and pain, but then the psalm ends up on a very positive, hopeful note. Yes. And so, that, I don't know. That's so I've always heard that he was not really saying to God that you've forsaken me. He was quoting this psalm. And he was saying how he felt, you know, he, he's saying this sucks, <laughs> you know, this is how this feels. But in quoting that Psalm, when he could barely speak, you know, that Psalm lived in his heart, just the way he's always quoted little snippets of prophecy. And we've gone back and read the whole thing. And we're like, mind blown as to what he's communicating. Same thing here easy to remember because it's the one before so, the Lord is my shepherd, you know? Um, so, so if, if you read that Psalm all the way through, as Woody says, it moves into, yeah, I'm suffering. Things are crap right now, but I trust you, God, and I am going to stand in your congregation and sing your praises. Mm -hmm. It is a willful choice in the worst of the worst scenario. Mm -hmm. It is a choice to trust that God's got this. It, it makes me wonder and begs the question, well, Christ is suffering and separating himself from the Father. Does the Father, although because he isn't separating himself from us, he's always reaching out to us, does he know the torment that his son is suffering? Does he feel that? You know, like twins feel each other's pain or That's you feel analogy. for your child. You know, when something goes well or goes wrong, you have that and joy as they do. This is going very badly at the moment for Christ. Although there is a very important follow-up to it, but if God is, if Christ is um, 
if Christ is all man at this time and God is revealing it to him as needed, he may not know what's coming next. Because I certainly don't expect to see my mother again. I would love that, but I don't expect that. And he knows he's dying. Does he know he's going to rise again? I think, I think he does because he talked about the temple um being torn down and then rebuilt in three days and and the reference to the wheat um that that the dying of the wheat brings forth new life um so i think at this point in the process yeah he knew yes. he was gonna resurrect on the third day but then that would be not the typical human experience i well, still had to go through all of the pain and the torture and the dying all of that physical agony he still had to go through, even if he knew that that wasn't the end of the story. That's and how I, I grew up with all the thing about he had to experience all that because that was him taking on the punishment basically that we all deserve yeah. the way it was yeah. put. So it's like that sacrificial lamb that something had to die and you're going to come up with something else to take the place. And that was always presented as the good thing because that's how we are able to be saved. I'm sorry. That is a, a very common and prevalent um, theology. And I hope that I've, you know, offered you other ways to understand this. Um, oh, yes. That gets ingrained over years of Baptist. And in addition to that, I was taught that at that moment that Jesus died, that God turned his back, that God couldn't look on him because he had all the sins of the world, past, present, and future on him, and God can't look at sin. Yeah, I was taught that. And I believed that for years. Oh, I can't and, go there. And now I'm seeing... God never took his eyes off. Jesus was suffering more than I've ever suffered. But he was suffering so that he could identify, so that we could identify, so that we, we could that he's identify. Gone through worse than I've come through. And he stayed faithful and he kept his eye on God. And what's the more important part of that is that God always had in his hands. And God always had us, and always has us in his hands. And being taught that when he said, you've forsaken me, that God was turning his back on him, always hurt me. And to know that that was not the right teaching. But an emotional, obviously. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that was standard theology in most of the churches that I grew up in, is that, that Jesus took all of our sin on himself, and, and it was so awful that God couldn't even look at us. I mean, that, that teaching that we are just so horrible. God cannot look on us unless we're washed in blood. And the is through Jesus' blood. Yeah. And, and, you know, unpacking that over the years has been a journey. Yeah. And I saw you had some comments. Um, do you even remember what they were at this point? <laughs> Not really. Um, I've been thinking about what what would have been the difference if God had just planted Christ on earth as an adult. And I think that I agree with you guys in that he had to experience the entire human feeling 
And so that's why he came as a, as a baby. And I think also that, that during the moment of the crucifixion, as was pointed out to me in our group session, that it wasn't God who, who did this, it was human beings. And there had to have been just a horrible sense. You know, I look at, I look at parents who have to witness their child being executed and how horrific that must be to watch the last moments of your child. And I think that that may have been why God turned because he was like, wow, this is insane. And, but he has to go through this. It's a toughie. This is a bummer of a class today, guys. Like <laughs> we need to end with jokes or something cause I'm like bummed out. The resurrection is the positive at the end of the story. Yeah. Well, it hasn't happened yet. It's like I used to tell my daughter yet. when, it's like I used to tell my Sonia when we would go to Disney movies and she would always break down at the crisis moment of the movie. I had to keep telling her, it's a Disney movie. There's going to be a happy ending. You just got to get through this part to have the happy ending. <laughs> and and I just, to... go ahead, Woody. Bob, just, you got to get through Friday to get to Sunday. Yeah, yeah. But I, I just see it so poignantly throughout Jesus' life that at every single point, he pointed to God and said, I trust God. God is there. I don't need to hear the voices from heaven. That was for you guys. <laughs> you know? I know in my very fine heart that God is there and I trust God through this and it's all, even wonderful. if it means I am persecuted I am tortured I lose my life my disciples are clueless my message was is not going anywhere I you know I'm out here in Podunksville and I think my whole life has been a failure. You know, there are many things that could be running through his mind. Uh, you know, when we get to the Last Supper, you can see how emotional Jesus gets over praying to God, God, please help them remember everything I said. Please send them the helper to help them remember this. Just, you know, please take care of them. Please teach them. They're, they're not there yet, God. They, they're, they belong to me and I've brought them here safely, but, <laughs> but th there's more that needs to be done. Jesus is having to let go of his expectations. And he has taught us how to let go of expectations all the way along. This is all about trusting that God loves us and is life it's trusting that death and evil will not have the last word that's a lot of trust that's a lot of trust mm -hmm. that's a lot of trust and jesus walked through it i kind of think that I know, I agree with Marlene that he has, in the things he said, he's made it clear that he knows he will be tortured, it will be in Jerusalem, that he will die, and that he will be resurrected in three days. Those, he said that enough that that I'm, I, I feel like he has come to know that. I don't, he did, he began saying it at a certain point in his ministry, there was like this tipping point. He didn't say it all the all the way through. So I think this is like he's coming to understand that God has revealed that to him at some point. Um, but but this today, it was he never knew when it was going to happen. And somehow today he knew the time had come. He knew it was close, but today he knew the time had come. Martha. I think it was Woody, uh, we were talking about how humans treat each other and he used example of Emmett Till and the National Monument that has just been declared. And um, his mother had 
Emmett's casket open so that evil would not get the last word. Yeah. And I just, that feels really connected. Yeah. Yeah, amen. In the, in the second question, um, it was really, I just wanted to bring forth um, the point that the imagery Jesus used today was of a piece of grain dying. He said, you know, unless that wheat dies, unless it dies and produces the seed and the seed is planted there, there will be no grain, you know, future, there will be no future grain harvest. This is a cycle. This is a cycle these people understood. This is imagery they understood. And my point was to what you all were talking about earlier is that Jesus using this natural cycle of life and death, of dying, of living, generating fruit, dying. And then that fruit, gener dying, living, generating more fruit, you know, dying, generating more fruit, that that ongoing cycle is what Jesus is calling forth as the example of his crucifixion. It had nothing to do with punishment and God needs blood. Amen. And, and those are Jesus words and I'll stand by that, you know? I think I heard that from time to time growing up and I may have heard the thing about, you know, the world went dark because the sins were on him. But I don't think I ever bought it. And that's kind of a hard thing to say because you're taught these um, beliefs and you're supposed to buy them, but I kind of picked and choose the few. And that was one I didn't go with, you know? I do observe three hours of silence on Good Friday when the earth was dark and when Christ was suffering and left us, you know? And it's hard because I'm a chatty person and that three yeah. hours is hard, you know? I tend to work Good Friday and people want to ask me questions and I'm like, 12 to 3, I'm not going to be speaking. I can email you, which is kind of a skirt around it. The whole point is not to communicate, but to focus on the gift that I've received and at what cost that gift was. And it was the life of our savior. You know? It was his whole life. Was everything life. he had to give. You know, he gave everything. He gave his all, as we say, about our soldiers. And that's what he has called us to do. That's what the call is. You know, um, it was a beautiful thing. And so uh, the the very the very um, last question just had to do with us realizing that Jesus was feeling trepidation as he was getting closer and closer to being tortured. I don't think I would sleep much, you know? And, and, and now he knows that that time has come and, and does that speak to us being able to, to feel trepidation, even if we are walking in the will of God and this is our choice. I think we spent a good amount of time on our fears when we're stepping out to do what we think is consistent with God's calling in our lives. Because we have to make choices and sometimes they're hard choices is it are, you know it's i think i made a comment about when we do things 
in our lives thinking that it's God's will. Sometimes it's like Google Maps and there's a redirect, you know, because sometimes we don't always get that exactly the way it's going to go. We have expectations. We have plans that we set in place. And things don't always go according to plan or expectations. And then we question, well, was it God's will? Did we step out on ourselves? It's, it's hard to know, but we also know that God has us and he will redirect. Yep. I think, you know, I, I, was it, I don't remember who was talking at the very beginning about agonizing over choice A and choice B. Oh, sure. Sure. there you go. Um, and, and I think we, you know, what, what we're trying to break up here is that idea of needing to make a choice between A or B in terms of what we do. It's who we, our only choice is light or darkness, life or death. That is our choice. And within that, if we choose life, if we choose light and we, and we are doing our best as human beings to see God in whatever situation we're in, it's not going to matter choice A or choice B. Choice B, God's going to be there, whichever way we go. And if we screw up, you know, like Julia says, maybe we thought that both choices were great. And then we get down there and we find, oh, this path is leading to death. That's not what I want. You know, the fruit on this path is not good. It's time to turn around. It's like GPS. There's a redirect. And God is with you the whole time. God can redeem any choice you make, God will be there. There are better choices and there are worse choices. We all know that we're grownups. But God is there in all of it. Martha said, um, I have to read you her note. She said, she texted me. She said, I wasn't raptured just now, were you? Actually, the battery on my laptop died. I'm not going to rejoin because I need to get to my volunteer game. <laughs> Poor Martha, well, she keeps missing that rapture. <laughs> this is probably a good time for me to say I need to get back to work. And so. it's probably a good stopping point for all of us. It's been a great discussion today, folks. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.